have our final talk of the conference today, which is a talk uh, titled Building Intuitive Common Line Interfaces in .NET by Alex Stephen. And uh, Alex, just to introduce you a little bit, uh, currently works at Xperit. He has been involved in application development since late 90s. He's worked as a lead developer and architect at large enterprises and small companies. And he's received Microsoft MVP award for uh, Visual Studio and development, development technologies 15 times by this point. And he sp spends a lot of his time teaching other developers uh, the details of the Microsoft development platform. And also, uh, besides that, he also mentioned that he is a really big old game, old video game enthusiast. Is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. I, I like spending my time playing the 8 bit video games. Oh, okay. A anyone else here is doing the 8 bit video games? Nintendo, Atari? No one? Oh, you're I'm sure somebody out. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so will, the, will you tie it in in your talk today? Sorry, Will you tie it in your talk today? Yes, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as a theme because um, oh, yeah. otherwise it will be customers and orders again, you know, the, the, right, the typical right. stuff, but now it's something different for a change. Okay, that sounds exciting. So without further ado, let us welcome Alex Tucson and prepare you, uh, go for your talk. Thanks. Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I guess um, we are about to have my slides on in a second. Yes, they are there. All right. I realize that I'm between you and the after party, so uh, let's, let's dive straight into uh, what we are going to talk about. That's command line interfaces. And um, coming from a, an era where we had a lot of graphical user interfaces, it's good to take this comparison in the spectrum of uh, what you would do with graphical user interfaces or GUIs and what's with the command line interfaces where you work from a terminal or a console window. Um, for the user experience, you would typically build something that would be a GUI um, because it has a rich user interaction and um, it has many forms of visualization. But that will not help you out as much if you want to be very efficient because if you're a developer, like all of us here probably, then you want to be able to do something fast with small, uh, low-level access to whatever you're trying to do. And that from a text-driven command line because that's where you can be fast. Um, it becomes even more important if you start going for automation. And that might be um, when you're doing DevOps or if you do full automation with CI CD pipelines, then it doesn't help you very much if you have a graphical user interface that requires user interaction. So command line interfaces have evolved and have become more and more important. Um, the cross-platform story, it kind of puts us in the middle because uh, either way with the new MAUI, the, the user interfaces in .NET 6 that are coming, it might be easier to create cross-platform user interfaces as well. But especially on part of the, um, the automation, that's where you want to go and create a command line interface. And probably you recognize some of the examples that I've listed here. Um, as a .NET developer, I'm sure you ran into the .NET EXE, the driver for uh, the .NET um, engine. And there's the AZ, the Azure CLI, and there's a bunch more when you're doing containers, if you're working with package managers or with your Git repos. Um, there's, there's other ones that are out there. There's even interactive ones that don't just execute a statement and return to the command line, but that put you into this um, repeat um, um, mode where you are in a separate command line and then do other types of command instead of just from the regular way. Um, let's, let's have a small look at what we'll be doing. And I'm, I'm running Windows Terminal. You can do the, the command prompt from Windows itself, but if you go into the Windows Store, Microsoft created this Windows Terminal. Um, it is this one here. It allows you to have multiple tab windows. You might have come across it, um, but I recommend using this one because if you create new windows, you can even do uh, Debian, Ubuntu, and other Linux distros from the very same Windows Terminal. And the good thing is that in um, the latest version, um, not many gamers out here, but if you know Quake and the Quake mode, it's uh, Windows with the back tick, the um, left, top left uh, corner keyboard. Um, if you press that one, you'll get a command window. It's not really good. You can't really see it very well, but let me put something white in the background. So if you do this, then you immediately drop down into this command line. Um, now, I've, I've, um, you can run your uh, commands here. 
Typically for intuitive command line interfaces, they will provide you with a bit of help. And the help that is there will allow you to discover what is there. And if you go a bit further and you do .NET Run, um, you probably want to have some help there as well when you start running your application and you see all these command line switches that you can use and you learn and go from there. Um, one thing to note is that um, if you do something like .NET Add, it says it can't really execute it because a required command has not been provided. Um, so if you ask for help there, you'll see that there's additional commands that you need to add. And this is something new where you can have nested uh, sub, uh, sub commands in your command line. And that's emerging as well. All right. So um, the other thing that I wanted to show you is um, if we, um, um, I created this, this, this emulator once. And it's uh, for an old video game arcade, uh, arcade video game that you can have hold in your hand, the Atari Lynx. And I've always messed around with the code if I wanted to run it, but you couldn't probably run it because it was a Windows-based application and you wanted to say which game you want to run inside of the emulator. Um, so I thought, okay, if you can build command line interfaces, there might be an easier way to interact with it, it because otherwise you would have to go into your emulator, open file dialogues and work from there. Um, so if you have that um, emulator, it's the Atari Lynx emulator. Um, if you run it like this, it will say, okay, you didn't give any required arguments. Um, in the list here, you can see that there's arguments there. That's the game file ROM. Um, so apparently I need to do that. So let's do the um, a ROM file, which is a binary of a game. And then I can do some magnification, for example, of 12. And let's see if this will run. Now, depending on the magnification, the window will be smaller or larger. But this, this is the emulator running. And you can just quickly spin it up from the command line. I've taken this as the theme to show you how you can build such um, command lines and get all the help information and all the interactiveness that is there. So let's drill down and look at how you can build that yourself in your applications. First of all, it's important to, um, to realize that if you have a, um, a command line, that there's a syntax involved. You run the command, that's the executable, um, then you can pass in additional commands, but it always has these uh, arguments and options. Arguments are positional. They don't have a name per se. They might have behind the scenes, but the options which are optional, they have names because they can be there or they can't be there. Um, and that um, allows you to specify which options in a, an undetermined order. That's why you need the names there. Short names, long names to make it easier. And um, usually use this, um, this delimiter, the dash dash, for example, or a single dash or a slash to indicate what option is uh, the, the one that you're mentioning there. And then you have the arity. That's how often you will encounter a value. That might be none, so it's a um, no value there, like for a, a Boolean switch. It's, if it's there, it's true. Um, but it might also be unary, so it's 0 or 1. Um, it might be more than 1. Now, whenever you are running the uh, command line lifecycle, it usually starts with the inputs arriving into your application. It's, um, it's a command line interface, so you have, might have arguments at the command line. But there's also ways to put those arguments inside of a response file as a single line or uh, each argument on a separate line. Um, there might be other ways of doing tab completion, which is something that some of the uh, libraries support to allow you to even um, easier navigate and learn your command line interface. Internally, if you kick off your uh, yeah, and, and start your application, um, you will, you will uh, internally do your coding to build this, the commands that you recognize in your application. Um, you specify which arguments are there, which options are available, and the configuration that you want to use. Then um, once that is done, the, um, the program that you're building will um, create a parser that is able to do the tokenization of all the commands, arguments, and options, and knows how to do value conversion. And that's called binding, where you, they bind the actual input that is received to the values that you are expecting to get. Um, they are typed values, so it might be strings, it might be integers, or uh, even enumerations and other things. 
That's all put together into a context, and then finally you end up at where it's all about. It's your logic, your handler that says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You gave me input, and this is how we'll use it to tweak the execution of our application. And sometimes leading up to there, there might be some little bit of middleware, which is an interception-based way to reach your handler, where you can decide or change the input as you go through the pipeline. And if it's a long-running operation, then my, maybe you want to give some feedback, or maybe you want to prompt the user to get additional uh, information, like say um, you uh, specify a command line, but you need to provide a password that you don't want to put into the command line in a script. Um, then you can have it pop up there, or you can read, read it from an environment variable or, or, or a secret store. Um, you might render some output, like progress bars or so, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then finally, usually after one cycle, your application terminates, and that's where you um, um, do all the exception handling. If it was something went wrong, that might be a reason to report errors or change the exit code from a zero success to some other value indicated what happened inside of your application. Um, and you might give some help or suggestions on how to improve the next time you're running in. Like we saw with the, the, the red messages, you didn't provide an argument. Now, if you want to do this in, um, in .NET, um, let's start with your process. That's being hosted. Your application code lives somewhere. And most of the time, your application model has this programming interface. We're not talking web APIs here. It's, it's your application programming interface, the way to interact with your logic. And normally, you would need to build something like a screen or a web API to actually call into that. But now we're going for a command line interface. And when you're a user and you have a terminal script and you want to um, call that with the, uh, the uh, arguments and input, then you want to reach out to that API and finally uh, manage to call the application code. And what we're doing in, the, in our demos and in the libraries, that we'll, it's usually about creating this command object and creating a command handler as well. And there's a couple of uh, packages out there. The system command line is the one we'll be looking at today. But there's another one called uh, CLI Framework. There's the Spectre Console CLI uh, package, and then somewhat older one that is called Command Line Parser. Um, you can use either of these. Um, it's just a matter of taste. The one from System Command Line is provided by Microsoft and is in active development, and is pretty rich in functionality, as you'll see. It's a command line um, um, object model. It, it looks a little bit like this. Um, if you want to implement what we just said about the, 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 the whole flow and the life cycle of the application, um, then uh, first thing, um, when you're coding, you need to prepare the commands. And that's your code, your classes. You derive from the command um, base type, and you spec or, or you, you use the command um, uh, objects that are there, and you specify which arguments, options are there, and uh, ultimately also which handler you're going to use. And it expects a certain interface, I command handler, and you need to implement that directly or indirectly. Now, commands can be hierarchical, so you have nested subcommands, but it all boils up to this uh, root command in the end, which you then supply to a object that's the command line builder. That's similar to what .NET Core uses for, or ASP.NET Core for the, the web host builder. It's, it's a builder pattern that, uh, that gives you the, um, the option to add um, commands there and configure everything on how to deal with these command line uh, interfaces. Finally, then, you do the parsing and invoking. So you're parsing whatever you got as input. Um, the parser takes care of that, and it runs the pipeline. It binds the values from whatever came on your command line to the object model that you created. And that's the entire cycle. So starting with a command, feed it into the command line builder, the, let the parser take care of it, and the parser will eventually call your handler logic. All right. There's, uh, to the side, I uh, included some additional ones that you might run into, because the, the object model recognizes symbols as the underlying base class for arguments, options, and commands, uh, because they have a name and sometimes they have a value as well. Um, there's other interfaces that you might find convenient at some point in time. And do know that this uh, system command line um, uh, library is under .NET Foundation, so there's a, a part of that as well. 
All right. So what I did, I uh, took um, I took Visual Studio 2022. Um, I created this library here that has this fake emulator logic. So, so we don't get to bother with everything that is there. You see that it's targeting .NET 6. But I think this will run for any .NET Standard 2.0 compatible .NET runtime. Um, that would be, I think, uh, .NET 2.0 or maybe 2.1. Um, that's for the, uh, the library that we'll be using. This, this emulator logic is a, a client. And instead of running an actual emulator, we will just output whatever is put in there as startup options. A constructor will take these uh, client options. And if we go into the client options, you'll see that um, I use this uh, C-sharp 8 thing called records instead of a class, which is an immutable record type, um, um, class type. It can only be um, set at uh, creation with a um, um, constructor that has a, a required um, file info object. So you can never have client options without providing a, a file info object. Um, and it has these other things that represent the options that you can specify as well. So this is the argument. These are the options that we'll be using. And as you can see, they're init, uh, meaning that you can only be set at construction time. And they have these defaults. So nice and compact way to package everything together that we want to use when starting the emulator. Now, this is in a separate library, because your application logic will most likely be as well. And then you will uh, start creating this um, command line interface. And if you look at the uh, packages that are there, then you'll find that there's this system command line package included in, uh, in here. So we can create a, um, an entry point with a static void main. And let's have a look at that. So we have a static vo um, int main int for the return code, and the, um, the string array of arguments that is there, so you can provide command line arguments. Everything behind the .exe is passed into your application. Um, let's run this. And what you'll see is that we'll go through uh, all of the steps that we saw earlier. So in this case, there's only a root command. We'll create a root command. We we'll give it a name, so a description that uh, will surface later. You can set at the root command a certain set of uh, properties that will, um, well, in this case, it will say that uh, if you match things at the command line or you can't match them to something known, you should raise an error. Maybe you mistyped something. And then it's a matter of. Um, building up the command. What are the arguments? And in this case, it's an argument of type file info. So it's typed arguments. You give it a name, that's for later. And you give it a description, that's for the help. That we'll uh, cover as well. Um, then you can go for options. Um, you can do it in a small, compact way. And what you see here is that we're providing a long name and a short name as well. So that's an alias. Then, um, well, more options. And if you want to, uh, you can be uh, pretty uh, elaborate and uh, verbal about it. So, so add aliases, set default values, whether they're required or not. And even go with custom validation, which allows you to inspect the value and make um, very smart decisions. An integer that might be between a couple of values, um, or sometimes even uh, checking maybe with a web API call if, um, if the weather is of the right temperature or something. Um, so you can go all out there. You add those options as well. And then you come to the point where you have this handler. And instead of um, implementing a class with the I command handler that we saw earlier, there's this factory method called command handler create. And this is pretty nifty. It has a, a generic up to 16 types. Um, and in this case, you see that there's an integer for magnification, a Boolean for full screen, then the controller type for keyboards or um, a, a controller gamepad, and then the file info for the, the game ROM and the boot ROM. That, those are the things that were present in the options. Um, with this, something magical happens. And we'll, we'll get into that uh, later on. But essentially, what you've done is you've said, I want to have a handler that takes these type types and you should pass the, the execution to this method called emulate. And the emulate method is here. And it has 
In the same order, the types like int for magnification, bool for full screen, it has all these named arguments, which will, as we'll see, line up with whatever you put into the command line arguments. Um, then we'll build the, uh, the record type, which is the client options, um, and we should end up with everything that is there. Now let's see what, what came in. The full screen was true, magnification was seven, and the boot ROM was uh, not available, and the keyboard for the controller. Now you might wonder where did those values come from? And for testing purposes, you can use launch settings, and then in the command line arguments, you can specify uh, whatever is provided to your application as argument. So this is the command line that, that we were executing a moment ago. And that has been parsed and has been uh, um, done. So if we continue and see what the output is, you will actually see this um, output that we saw earlier for the fake emulator at this point. Okay. Now, what happened there with the create? We saw that um, you could specify a particular method that it dispatches to. If you want to, in this example, you can do a lambda expression as well. Um, that's your choice, whatever is convenient. But by using this factory method, it will create this model binding command handler with a delegate pointing into your method. In our case, that was the emulate. Uh, it could also be your lambda expression as it's provided there. But since this is an implementation that does model binding, you get all the parsing and coercion of those values that are provided into your, um, uh, you get that for free. We'll, we'll run into that in a, in a moment. For reference, and I'll be brief here, but there's a, um, a long pipeline that will be run before we actually reach your command handler. And if you use the command line builder, um, that will help you there. There's this convenience method called use defaults. You get pretty much all of out of the box um, um, pieces of middleware, which contain little steps of do you want to have the help option? Do you want to have typo corrections? Um, do you want to use the debug directive? That will be wired up for you. And you get the chance to put your middleware logic and specify at which stage you want to have your middleware logic run. Um, that's for advanced scenarios, but um, it might be um, a good place to do some interception of whatever you um, um, no, would normally execute. And it would look like this. So you have this command line builder with the root command, and then you have the use default, so we get everything uh, that we just saw in the pipeline. And then in this use middleware, you can have an async method that is given a invocation context, and the next piece of the handler in the pipeline. And where it says in a comment, execute your middleware logic here, just imagine this scenario. You have a self-hosted web API, and it uses a entity framework uh, DB context, and you're using migrations. Now, how cool would it be that inside of your pipeline, before you actually spin up your web API with a self-hosted, uh, running it with .NET run, um, you could provide a command line argument that would say, I don't want to run it, but I want to m do the migration. So perform a migration to this particular stage. And that you could intercept in your middleware here, where you're saying, okay, if we find the command that's called migrate, don't go into the rest of the, the, the pipeline, just terminate it here and uh, run my migrations for me. Now, the model binding that we get if we use uh, command handler.create, it acknowledges again that there's named arguments because we gave it a name and there's named options. Then uh, you would um, have your method with the same um, um, arguments in there, with the same types that we saw earlier in the create. Um, and they don't have to be in order because they will line up based on names. And it's, it's a smart matching. So it even does this thing called kebab matching, where I think of this, this long metal rod with all the pieces of meat on it. Um, that's how it distinguishes full minus screen, that it should remove the hyphens in between and maybe even do casing there, like full capital S screen. Um, so it's pretty smart about that. It uh, ignores all the other hyphens and um, prefixes. 
It knows about the aliases, so even though we have minus m, it was also dash dash magnification, they go together. So if there's an int magnification, that will match up as well. And they are even reversed in order, so that doesn't matter. It knows about uh, the controller and the enumeration type keyboard, because that's controller type keyboard, and it knows how to deal with that as well. And then finally, the first part is the argument um, that goes to um, um, the name that you provided there. And in all these types that are available, it, um, it, it knows how to coerce or change them from a string to whatever you're asking for. So in 32 parse will be used, but also constructor types such as file info or URI can be used to give you a rich object instead of just a string. Um, but even better, now we, we're dealing with all these separate um, arguments and we see that in our, our run method as well. And that's kind of sorry because we, we had this client options, right? And that had properties that match up as well. So it even can do the matching based on the properties that are on your class, in this case our record for client options, or it can do the, um, uh, in the constructor, if it finds a constructor with matching arguments, it will do, use that to create the client options object. And there's other ones that are there um, that give you this very rich way to interact with whatever happened before. Um, ultimately, uh, the most important one is the invocation context, which contains all of the things listed above. So from your console, the result of the parsing, um, a cancellation token if you're doing async work, so you can gracefully exit if, if a cancellation is requested. Um, and the binding context is what we just looked at if you want to inspect how binding was done and what was the result. All right, so let's take it a bit further with um, creating this uh, smart command line. Um, we'll do this one now. This is the advanced version. What changed here? Um, first of all, this one um, uh, doesn't have just one command. It has two commands. So the, the, the original command to do the emulation is now being explicit. So instead of uh, running just, and let me just show you that quickly in the command line. Um, this one here. Um, so if we're here, we'll do .NET run because we're in the root of our uh, application. And now, just to show you something that is irrelevant later on, um, let's say we do .NET run, it will run our application. And, um, but I, if I want to have help and I do minus minus help from my application, I get the .NET help. So how do I tell the .NET thing, leave this one alone? It's dash dash with nothing, and then everything after that will be passed into your code. So if we do this, then we can see that um, this, this um, tool now has two commands, emulate and convert. And this is where emulate comes from. So we create this emulate command, and the rest of the code is the same. It has the arguments, um, and, and that's it. It, it uh, contains the handler, and it's all neatly packed together. So a single command with its own handler. And similarly, I created this one, uh, a convert. And a convert is for converting ROM files, because sometimes you need that in life. And the convert, it takes an input file, and you might provide the output file, um, the name of the output file. So it's from to a file. Um, what you see here in new things uh, that are uh, nifty is that you have this argument that you must provide because we can't convert if you don't give a file name. Um, and we're telling it in the argument existing only. So it should be an existing file that, that will take care while we're running the command line uh, part of our code that it already checks if the file is there. So you don't have to check that anymore. Then uh, we add options for the output. Um, it's an option. And I showed some other things here where you can say, you want to parse the argument yourself. And you can do this calculation of if, um, uh, if I have this file, um, I can change the extension to be this particular extension because that's a, an assumed default if you don't provide anything. But it should end up with legal file names. Not existing, because it might not exist yet, but ex legal file names. So that's all built in uh, there as well. Now, um, the code, we will look at the convert code in a minute. Um, but this um, allows, um, it does the following. So it has this input, it has output, and it has the invocation context. And the invocation context was, gives you the ability to get this cancellation token. 
and, and we'll look at this bit of um, things here, but it does recognize here that if the cancellation is requested, we'll stop from processing whatever we're processing here. And the net result of that code uh, would be something like this. So we have the uh, dot slash al. Oh, no, 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 sorry. We're in this folder here, dot net run, dash, dash. And then we're saying convert. And we'll say something like um, zarlor print bin. That might be the file. Now, if you run this, and it should parse everything, and remember what is happening here. We're doing a little bit of progress reporting and um, interacting with the user. Now, this is something that, uh, that's part of the last bit of the session. So, and if I press Control-C, it gracefully exits. doesn't do anything weird. It just stops processing. And Control-C is a request for the console application to cancel. So the cancellation token is set, and that's passed into our logic, and we gracefully exit from the while loop that we saw here. So while uh, we're not finished yet with all these tasks, uh, we're, we're running this, and that's showing the progress bar. But this might be your processing or whatever logic that you have. OK. Now, to make it a little bit more intuitive, we already saw quite a number of things. You, you saw that it gave us this re very rich help. That's provided for free. Um, but if you want to really dive into command line interfaces, take note of the other things as well, that you design your application to be usable f as a human where from a command line interface. So it should be right small little nuggets of interaction and actions that you can do that makes everything efficient and um, is, is discoverable very well. Part of it is that you should have familiar names. And the arguments and options that you're using shouldn't have names that are, um, are different names than what you are used to. So um, something like um, uh, dash dash yes would be good. But if you change that to be something uh, dash dash OK or something, then it doesn't um, ring a bell, maybe. And then finally, splitting up your system in small chunks um, so that they are able to execute individually would be a good design pattern. So you can align your command line commands to the bits of functionality in your application. Help was provided out of the box. There's um, a lot of help that you get there for free. If you have uh, needs to um, add stuff there, you can create your own help builder. And uh, one thing um, that is not available in this library is the use of examples. But you could create a new help builder that allows you to output some examples of what you could add to the command line. It does have um, um, a nifty thing with a global tool. And how you install it is listed at the bottom for suggestions. And that allows you to do tab completion and discovering the command line arguments and the commands that are there. Um, it relies on interacting. Your application interacts with .NET Suggest. Um, and it's only usable from a, um, a terminal that is able to do that kind of interaction. So that, that would be PowerShell, Bash, or Z Shell. Um, so the global tool needs to be installed, otherwise it won't work. There's bash scripts and PowerScript files that um, in, the, in the documentation on the GitHub site. Um, and then finally, you have suggestion sources on your side. But do know that if you have, um, for example, enumerations or certain set of arguments and options, those are already well known and are available with this completion. There's a little bit of things that you can add to do uh, some logging on and if it, if it doesn't work, um, and then you can find out what might be there. Now, then f f uh, for the final part, um, some tips on debugging. Because you saw me um, running it from Visual Studio. You also saw me doing .NET Run. Um, but there might be more to it if you want to run from the command line. There's this debug directive that you need to specify immediately after your executable, and then the rest of the command line uh, follows. If you specify that, uh, it allows you to attach a debugger from that point on, and I'll show that in a bit. But there, there might be an error there um, saying that it's, this is a security precaution. You're not allowed to debug this. This is what you might want to remove for a production tool that you're building. For debugging, if you have a debug build, this will be good. Just add this environment variable that says .NET command line debug processes and specify the name of your executable or maybe alternatives with a uh, semicolon at the end. So that's where you need to uh, change things. 
And I already showed you, but this is for um, um, reading uh, later on, that the dash dash that is listed at the bottom allows you to pass in from .NET Run um, all the arguments. And .NET Run will leave them alone. There's other directives, and I've listed parse and suggest, and we'll, uh, we'll look at that in a, in a second. Um, let's do that just right now. Um, let's go here. Um, OK, so we had this command line here. Um, remember that we need to um, go directly after .NET Run. So we can do something like parse, um, parse as an example. And what it will do, it will run the parsing. And um, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. As you can see now, it, the result of the parsing is this line here. Um, it says, um, Zarlo print bin was uh, an argument that was provided. We didn't get an argument for the output, but we created one that's so that the star means the default. Um, and that's Zarlo LNX, where we replaced it with um, a well guessed alternative for the output file. If you don't provide anything, so let's say you would, um, let me clear the screen. If you would forget to include this convert, then the parsing will help you and say, OK, we got something, but we don't know what it is. Um, if you would do something like uh, convert zar or bin to um, output.lnx, something like that, it will also say, OK, this is weird because the, I expected something with dash dash output, but it wasn't provided. OK, so it might be a reason to not make this an option, but this would be even better. But then it still says it's not correct. It's not a legal file name, as it turns out, because you can't do the slash in a file name as a legal file name. If that's not good enough for you, you can always change the logic of your code. But now we're, we're good. This is the parsing. If you change this to be uh, debug, Then it will say, OK, now you can attach a debugger. And you don't have to go to Visual Studio, change your launch settings, and then start debugging because you were already there. And this is where you want to do the debugging uh, thing. All right. Um, then uh, final things, um, Dragon Fruit is a way to create a, um, um, a very fast command line interface without all of the hassle if you just want to have a simple single command thing with arguments, options, and some defaults. And this is what you would do. You would include the NuGet package system command line dragon fruit, change, remove your static void uh, or static in main with no arguments or string array arguments, and then specify what we specified in our run method. And compiler magic will make sure that this is changed into a command with options and arguments. Well, only options, by the way. Um, and if you provide XML documentation, that will turn into the help that you'll get from um, um, your application. So Dragonfruit is also pretty cool. Um, we've looked at most of this. Let me go to Dragonfruit. Um, let me show the code first. Because the code is pretty simple now. Because this is the uh, the file, uh, sorry, the, uh, the 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 startup method, but it doesn't comply with what you should have. Um, this is the um, the the documentation, and the rest is pretty much the same. Behind the scenes, in your OBG debug, your target folder, you will find that it generates this program GCS, and that has the actual static void main, in this case, static task of int main. And this is your entry point that was, will be created. And the net result is that if you go here um, and you do .NET run, uh, dash, 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 help, and the running is the same, but you, you get this thing from Dragonfruit. And it has almost all those things the same, except that you see you have little control over what happens here. And they do this if you have Pascal casing. Uh, sorry, in it caps the camel ca uh, no, sorry, the camel casing. It will do the, the, the kebab casing to make the arguments. Now you saw that we had this progress bar, right? Um, and this is a point where you might say, ooh, um, so this console, I can do I can do graphical user interfaces there. Um, 
that, that's not the message here. Uh, it might be convenient to have output so the, uh, the user knows what is going on, but for the automation scenario, that shouldn't be there. So do recognize that the console is not maybe the console that, that you're working on as, a, as an end user. It might be your Azure DevOps or uh, GitHub pipelines that will run things. Um, so when you're using it, use this interface called iConsole that allows you to detect, um, uh, first of all, writing, uh, reading from in, writing to out or error uh, for errors and it allows you to see if it's being redirected because if you're piping it into a text file, the output, then you should know that it's going there and maybe you want to strip out the progress bar report and just skip that and say we're finished converting or something. If you want to dive into doing more of uh, uh, terminal graphical user interfaces, spectre.console is a really nice one and you can see from the screenshot that they have on their website that you can do these tables with nesting and trees and, and the progress bar and spinners and, and everything that we saw there. But do remember, if you're building for a command line interface, it's not a graphical user interface. If you want to do a comparison of the other things, um, I kind of did that for you, but it's my opinion. So it, this, is, this is not actual science, but you can see the difference between the various frameworks and their activity and what they support or not. In the end, I, I hope that you got from this story that if you um, are targeting command line interfaces, that there's a whole bunch of things that you can do as, uh, from a uh, terminal perspective, from pipelines, you as an uh, efficient developer, or maybe someone just uh, who's loving .NET programming, uh, do know that um, the command line is fully supported and loved by all of these. So the, the command line interface, they, they will love each other forever, I think, from this point on. Um, that's it from my side. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, we will do uh, Discord afterwards as well. Thank you. And if you want to read up on this and see all the code samples that I used, uh, they're up on GitHub um, and also references to the NuGet packages that were mentioned. Uh, slides will be available. So you should be good to uh, um, dig into this if you um, got enthusiastic about it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the talk, Alex. Uh, the questions are coming in. I see people are typing. Um, let me see if there's anything on Telegram. So well, while people are still like I'm waiting for the questions, I do have one of my own. Ah, I good. mentioned that uh, you were you were you know you can use uh, middleware in pipelines inside of your CLIs. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some kind of integration with like the the hosting provider that .NET has capabilities for? Um, yes. So there's um, the the um, uh, if I read your question correctly, um, let's say we are hosting a um, a web service or maybe a hosted service in .NET Core. Could you interact with uh, the host that is hosting it because that has all these parameters for listen URIs and the ports that you okay that. And uh, is it possible? And yes, the answer is it is possible. And in the um, in the uh, code samples. If you want to see that, there's a, there's a small thing for an ASP.NET Core web application, and it does some startup as well. And then you can uh, drill into this and check out this use host. Because the, with this use host, you get a chance to configure your .NET configuration with command line arguments in the usual way. And you can interact with options where you can use those options like the uh, um, emulated client options, but bind them to the command line again. So you're, you're, that's in your application side, but you can still do all the binding and integration. And instead of just doing the invocation context, you can also um, have your handler method use iHost, which gives you access to everything that is inside of your hosting environment. Bringing two worlds together. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question for, from the audience. What about unit testing of console applications? Ah, yes. Very good, because you want to use um, unit testing here as well. And the good news is that this is fully unit testable because there's abstractions all over the place. For example, if you stay away from using console write line, but do uh, the iConsole interface, it has this dot out dot write. And then there's even in the libraries, there's a test console. 
implementation that does nothing but build up whatever you wrote to the console. And then you can inspect this internal string builder to see did we get the output we expected. Um, so yeah, you can run each of the commands and the arguments and do all this rich uh, um, testing. Right, so you, you basically have an in-memory like virtual kind of console. It, it just writes there. You can read it afterwards. Yeah, it's a virtualized terminal. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, one more question. Uh, what about interactive CLIs? Like uh, so far, I think we've only talked about you know CLIs that just kind of run. You pass in command arguments, but I know that for example, some CLIs have like an interactive mode for when the user runs them. So you could also like have prompts and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, is it something supported by system command line? Is it easy to do? Um, OK. The, um, yes. The, the, it's not supported by system command line. You'll need something like Spectre Console. It has all these dialogues and prompts that you can use to, to get even more input from the user. Um, yeah, and, and I think that um, creating this interactive, um, like, like this one, um, if we go here and we do something like net shell, you, you end up in this new command prompt that's net shell. And if you do help here, just help, you're, you're executing a command. And then you can say, I want to do firewall. And then you're inside firewall. And in here, then there, there's, in this context, there's even new things. So it's, it's kind of moves you one level away from the command line. And it, this is what I think is an interactive version. It's not too hard to build, because you can use that parser that you created and just feed it whatever is doing a command read line and just feed it in there. And then, then you should be able to build this yourself as well. It might even be a dash dash interactive as an option. Right. Or I guess you can probably like detect if the standard output is redirected. Like if it's running on CI, it's probably going to be redirected. Yes. And yeah, something like that. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so we don't really have any questions now. So maybe somebody from the audience uh, has something. I guess not. everybody's waiting for the party, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess everybody's just waiting for the party. Well, in that case, like if you still have questions to Alex, uh, you can catch him after his talk, uh, find him in some dark corner. Well, or maybe at the party. <laughs> <laughs> or at the party and just ask him your questions there. Or probably on his Twitter, like maybe you can tweet him. Yeah. Or on Discord, all the other channels that we have. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Have a great uh, conference.